Steve was dead. The horror of seeing his corpse was compounded by the knowledge that her last hope of rescue had vanished. She was the only one left alive. She suddenly remembered the rifle that Steve had kept in the office. She remembered arguing with Steve about the gun, wanting him to get rid of it, and now she thought of that rifle as her last chance. He had given in to her request and put it somewhere. Where? She had to think. The barn. She remembered he had taken it out there and hung it high up on the wall, well out of reach of any small children. She ran as fast as she could to the barn, praying she could make it in time. She reached the door and pushed it back, sliding it shut behind her, then leaned against it for a moment to catch her breath. No time, she told herself. No time. She'll be in here any minute. She ran to the opposite wall and climbed up on a table, reaching for the rifle mounted on hooks used to hold tools. She pulled it down and checked it. Of course, Steve had unloaded it. But the bullets had to be somewhere. Where would he have put them? She started searching madly through the drawers of the workbench, pawing through the tools. Where are the goddamn bullets? She cried, sobbing with fear. One of the cabinets was locked with a chain. They had to be in there. She damned Steve for being so conscientious. All the lights in the camp suddenly came on as Mrs. Voorhees started up the generator once again. With a cry of desperation, Alice began hammering on the chain with the rifle butt. The chain held. She smashed at it with all her might, trying to concentrate on breaking the lock. But it was no use. Trust Steve to use case-hardened steel. Damn it, she thought. Damn it. She had to break it. She simply had to. The racket she was making was certain to... The barn door slid open. Mrs. Voorhees stood in the entrance, her eyes glittering with an insane light. Alice dropped to her knees and leveled the empty rifle at her. Mrs. Voorhees smiled. Come, dear, she cooed. It'll be easier for you than it was for Jason. She moved forward slowly, as if in a trance, oblivious to the rifle pointed at her. Whether she knew it was empty or not seemed to make no difference. She wasn't going to stop. Kill her, Mommy, she said in a small child's voice. Kill her. Kill her. In desperation, Alice hurled the empty rifle at her. It struck her in the stomach and she doubled over with a grunt, but it didn't slow her down for more than a second or two. Alice started grabbing anything that was within reach, a ball of twine, a small can of paint, a box of nails, snatching things at random and throwing them at the crazy woman. But Mrs. Voorhees kept batting the objects away, relentlessly closing the distance between them. Alice found herself backed into a corner. She sobbed as Mrs. Voorhees seized her with one hand and started to slap her face with the other. Hard, powerful, stinging blows that snapped Alice's head back. She had never been hit so hard in her entire life. Her legs started to sag beneath her. That's right, said Mrs. Voorhees, grinning triumphantly, grabbing her with both hands and pulling her up to her feet. That's right. She picked her up and threw her across the room as easily as if Alice were a rag doll. Alice struck a table, which collapsed beneath her. She fell to the floor, stunned. But stark terror galvanized her into movement, and she rolled, scrambling for the fallen rifle as the woman came at her again. She grabbed the rifle in both hands, and as Mrs. Voorhees bent down over her, she swung it with all her might. The rifle butt cracked against the side of her head, and Mrs. Voorhees staggered. Alice jammed the rifle butt into her face. 
Mrs. Voorhees fell back on a pile of mattresses, and Alice didn't wait to see if she'd get up again. She turned and ran, bolting through the door, intent on putting as much distance between them as possible. She had to find a place to hide. She had to get away. Her only instinct was to flee. Mrs. Voorhees groaned as she slowly got back on her feet. Kill her, Mommy, she whined in her child's voice. Kill her. She can't hide. No place to hide. She moved to the barn door and stood, looking out, listening for the sound of running footsteps. Get her, Mommy. Get her. Kill her. Kill her! Kill her! She started toward the lake, heading straight for the dock like a hunter stalking prey. She heard the running footsteps receding down the path, and she paused, listening intently. But the footsteps had stopped. The girl was trapped. She smiled. Kill her! Kill her! There was nowhere to run. Kill her! No escape. No hope. She was down there someplace, huddling like a frightened, guilty little animal, knowing she was going to die, just as Jason had known the horrible reality as he slowly weakened, as his little muscles failed in their struggle to stay afloat, as his tears were washed away by the water that enveloped him. Kill her! She had punished all of them, every single one of them, had made them feel what her Jason had felt, that stark, unreasoning terror of impending death. They should have watched him, they should have protected him, they had failed him, and they had killed him, and now they had paid the price. There was only one more left, one more, and it would be finished. She breathed heavily as she crept down to the dock, listening for any rustle of movement, any telltale sob. Yes, cry, she thought. Cry as Jason cried. Suffer as Jason suffered. This one would not die quickly. Alice bit down on her fist to keep from making any sound as the woman moved past her. She crouched down behind a pile of lumber by the dock, watching Mrs. Voorhees as she walked right by her hiding place, pausing every couple of seconds to listen, staring out into the darkness. Don't even breathe, she told herself, fighting the urge to scream. She had to overcome the fear. She had to think. Nothing seemed to stop the mad woman. She had the abnormal strength of the hopelessly insane. God, there had to be some way to stop her. She just kept on coming. Alice felt the tears rolling down her cheeks as she tried to catch her breath. She couldn't think straight, no matter how she tried. She was trembling violently. Panic threatened to overwhelm her completely. Every instinct screamed at her to run. But she knew running would be useless. She could run into the woods, but she didn't know the area, and Mrs. Voorhees did. She had managed to stay hidden and kill them off one by one. What possible chance did Alice have? She knew she couldn't run down the road. She'd never be able to outrun the crazy woman. And besides, Mrs. Voorhees had the car. She'd never make it back to town. God! thought Alice. What am I going to do? She remained perfectly still, afraid to move a muscle. The rain had stopped, but the wind was still raging, and the black clouds rolled away, revealing a full moon. She peeked out from her hiding place and saw Mrs. Voorhees' white sweater as the woman moved down by the dock, searching near the boathouse. Slowly, carefully, Trying not to step on any branches blown down by the storm, Alice crept from her hiding place and headed back toward the cabins, glancing over her shoulder fearfully. If only she could find some place to hide. 
some place where she could barricade herself. If only she could manage to make it until daylight, someone was bound to come out to the camp. It was her only chance. Running on tiptoe, clenching her teeth to keep from crying out, she ran back to the main cabin. It was an obvious place. Maybe the woman wouldn't think to look there. If she barricaded herself inside again, no, that wouldn't do, she thought. That would only give her hiding place away. She could barricade the door, but there was nothing she could do about the windows. She ran inside the cabin and closed the door. Her wild gaze fell on Brenda's body, lying on the floor in a pool of blood amid shards of shattered glass. She whimpered, biting her lips to stop the screams that threatened to tear loose from her throat. She had to find a place to hide, but where? The pantry. She slipped to the window and glanced out. There was no sign of Mrs. Voorhees. Once inside the small pantry, she shut the wooden door behind her, turning the heavy wooden latch. She backed up against the wall and huddled in the darkness, trying not to breathe. Someone had to come. The lines must have been blown down by the storm, and they wouldn't be able to call the camp to find out if everything was all right. They'd have to send someone. But what if no one came? No, don't think of that, she told herself. Someone has to come. She gulped and took a deep breath, trying to steady her nerves, to stop her heart from pounding. She won't give up, she thought. I've seen her. I can identify her as the killer. She knows that she can't let me live. She brought her hands to her face, sobbing quietly. It was hopeless. The cabin door slammed open and she froze as the lights came on. She could see the light through the cracks between the boards of the wooden door. She could hear the woman moving around out there. Something crashed to the floor. Glass tinkled. Go away. Alice shut her eyes tightly and prayed. Please, please, go away. Suddenly, the cabin was silent. Alice opened her eyes and listened, holding her breath. The footsteps outside the pantry had stopped. She huddled on the floor just by the door, leaning against it, shivering and biting her lower lip. Please, please. The doorknob turned. The door started to rattle and she felt the impact of Mrs. Voorhees throwing her shoulder against it. She scrambled to her feet and backed away, looking at the shelves around her, desperately seeking something she could use as a weapon. She grabbed a large iron skillet and held it before her with both hands staring wide-eyed at the door. The door shivered as Mrs. Voorhees repeatedly threw herself against it, but it held. She couldn't get inside. Alice sobbed with relief. And then she heard the sound of something hard hitting the door. A chopping sound. One of the boards splintered as the blade of a machete ripped through. And again, and again, as the mad woman continued to hack at it. A large piece of the door broke loose and fell inside. Mrs. Voorhees looked through the gap, grinning insanely. She reached through and opened the latch, throwing the door wide open. No! 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 Alice felt the scream coming, and she couldn't stop it. Mrs. Voorhees raised the machete and lunged with a yell. Without thinking, reacting purely by instinct, Alice raised the skillet. There was a loud clang as the machete struck it, glancing to one side. Screaming hysterically, Alice swung the skillet once more. It struck the woman in the shoulder, stunning her momentarily, but Alice didn't stop. She swung the skillet again and struck the woman's head with all her strength. Hearing the dull sound of metal hitting bone again and again, Mrs. Voorhees cried out and staggered back bringing her hands up to protect her head. 
Alice kept pounding at her furiously until she fell back on the floor. She stood over the fallen body, ready to bring the skidlet down again, but Mrs. Voorhees didn't move. Alice held her breath. The woman lay motionless on the floor. Alice couldn't tell if she was breathing. Cautiously, keeping as much distance as she could between herself and the woman's body, Alice edged out into the kitchen. She reached out with her foot and gently prodded Mrs. Voorhees in the side, half expecting her to jerk up and grab her ankle in a powerful grip. But the woman didn't stir. There was a large bruise over her eye where the skillet had struck her. The skin had split and blood slowly trickled down her face. Swallowing hard, Alice turned the body over with her foot. There was a dark puddle of blood on the floor beneath the woman's head. Alice dropped the skillet. God, she thought, she's dead. I've killed her. Relief and revulsion overcame her at once, and she ran out of the cabin, gasping, drawing in deep lungfuls of the cool night air. I'm alive, she told herself, over and over again. Thank God, I'm alive. I'm alive. I'm alive. She couldn't stop shaking. She wandered down to the lake and stood in a daze. Suddenly her knees felt weak, and she crouched on the ground by the canoes, kneeling and looking at her reflection in the moonlit water. She felt numb. She stared at her reflection. It seemed as if she was looking at a stranger's image. The face that stared back at her was void of expression. She wanted to cry, but no more tears would come. She held herself as the convulsion started, and she thought she was going to throw up. Her insides were churning, and her throat felt dry. She couldn't swallow. She longed for the feel of the cool water on her face, and she leaned forward. A shadow fell across her. There was another image shimmering in the lake. The figure of a tall woman with blonde hair wearing a white, blood-stained sweater, raising a machete. Terror sent adrenaline trip-hammering through her as Alice screamed and seized a canoe paddle, spinning around, holding up the paddle to ward off the blow. The steel blade whistled down and bit into the paddle, chopping it in half, and Alice felt the impact shudder through her arms. She fell, scrambling to grab the severed paddle, rolled as the blade of the machete swept past her, missing her face by inches, and swung the paddle hard as the machete came down once again. The wood connected with the blade and sent it spinning from the woman's grasp, but the force of her swing had pulled Alice off balance. Before she could regain it, she felt herself seized from behind. Screaming, she flailed her arms and elbows, twisted loose and pulled away. Then felt a sharp pain in her shoulder as Mrs. Voorhees struck her with the broken paddle. Alice fell on her back and rolled to the side as Mrs. Voorhees stabbed down with the jagged end of the paddle, barely missing her. The splintered wood sank into the soft ground as Mrs. Voorhees fell forward, overbalanced. Alice leaped on top of her, desperately fighting for her life like a cornered animal. They rolled over and over on the ground, clawing and pummeling each other. But the older woman was stronger. She rolled Alice over and got on top of her, trying to pin her arms down with her knees, grabbing her around the throat and squeezing. Alice fought for breath, squirming beneath her, choking as the powerful fingers closed around her throat. She managed to lunge forward and fasten her teeth around the woman's wrist. She bit down hard, drawing blood. Mrs. Voorhees cried out and released her. Alice shoved away, coughing, gasping for breath, struggling to her feet. She started to run, but a hand closed around her ankle and threw her to the ground. She hit hard, falling on her chest twisting as she felt the woman climbing up her leg and straddling her back. 
grabbing a fistful of her hair and hammering her head into the ground. Alice buckled and thrashed like a fish out of water, almost dislodging her, squirming around and sinking her teeth into her arm, biting down with all her might. She felt the woman's grip relax and she hurled herself to the side, throwing her off, gasping for breath as she scrambled away, staggering to her feet. Her gaze fell on the machete, lying on the ground about five yards away. She lunged for it in desperation, felt her fingers close around the handle, picked it up and turned. Mrs. Voorhees was running toward her, her face twisted into a feral snarl of rage. Alice raised the machete. Mrs. Voorhees tried to stop herself, but she had too much forward momentum and her eyes grew wide as Alice brought the blade back. She opened her mouth. Alice gripped the machete tightly and screamed as she swung it in a wide sweeping arc like a baseball player connecting with a fastball. Mrs. Voorhees threw her hands up to ward off the blow and the blade struck her neck and sliced right through it. The force of Alice's desperate blow chopping through the spinal column, decapitating Mrs. Voorhees with one stroke. Her severed head fell to the wet ground, the mouth open in a soundless scream, the eyes blinking as blood gushed from the stump of her neck, blood spurting in fountains from her severed arteries. For a second, it seemed to Alice as if everything had somehow shifted into slow motion. The headless body remained standing for a moment, arms up, fingers clutching at the air. Then it slowly collapsed like a marionette with its strings cut, hitting the ground and staining it with a wash of blood that poured from the grisly wound. For a long moment, Alice simply stood there, numb and slack-jawed, her eyes wide, staring at the horror lying at her feet. Then the bloody machete slipped from her fingers and fell softly to the ground. In a daze, she turned away and walked unsteadily to the water, unable to comprehend what she had done. Her mind had retreated into shock. Without fully realizing what she was doing, Alice bent down and pushed one of the canoes into the water, stepped into it, and drifted onto the lake into the darkness, as if safety could be found on the water, out where no one could reach her, away from the horror of what had happened on the shore. She slumped down in the boat, just letting it glide, as her mind was drifting, sifting through random, disconnected images. As if drugged, she stared vacantly out across the water at the moonlight rippling on the surface of the lake. She trailed her hand in the water, feeling the coolness on her fingers, vaguely aware of the gentle rocking of the boat. She felt no relief at having escaped alive. She felt absolutely nothing. She was not aware of time passing. At some point, she noticed the sky turning gray with the first light of dawn. She became dimly aware of the sun's rays glinting on the lake. She seemed to hear, as if from a great distance, the sounds of birds singing. Morning came, and the mist began to dissipate. The woods around the lake seemed quiet and peaceful. Everything was still, washed clean by the storm. The surface of the lake was mirror smooth. A police car pulled up to the dock, lights flashing, though Alice heard no siren. Two officers got out and walked down to the shore. As if through a haze, Alice saw them cupping their hands around their mouths, calling out to her, but she couldn't hear a thing. She felt no sense of urgency, no desire to move. She just wanted to keep drifting out upon the lake, where it was quiet and safe. Something came bursting up out of the lake beside her boat. She felt the spray of water. She caught a brief glimpse of a body that looked like a corpse. 
smelled the sharp odor of decomposing flesh, felt clammy, slimy, rotting skin as an arm encircled her and seized her, pulling her out of the boat into the water, dragging her down beneath the lake. She opened her mouth to scream, 